Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first ever Coffee and AI with Sahini. This is the episode where we kick back and we learn about some of the latest and greatest and updates in the field of AI. I share tools and strategies in order for anybody and everybody to migrate a career and research paths and strategies in the field of AI. This is the first time that we are going to be doing this episode as a YouTube host, as well as we are going to have this as a podcast, which I'm going to be linking in the description box below so that if you're driving, if you just think of listening to an audio and not really care much about the video, you should be able to do that as well. So thank you so much for tuning in. So in today's episode, we are going to have two major segments. The first segment, I am going to be covering the latest and the greatest in the field of ChatGPT, how it came into being, how it is doing, and what are the latest disputes that is happening in the field of ChatGPT. And the second segment is the FAQs of the frequently asked questions that you have so kindly posted on some of my other YouTube videos or have sent me in LinkedIn or in the ask ask me a question form that I have posted on my Google sites. Again, all of them, I am going to be linking in the description box below so that next time, if you feel you have another questions with regards to, you know, AI, a natural language processing or computer vision, even with regards to career laptop trends and anything and everything that you would like answered in the field of AI, please, please, please do leave me a comment and I might just pick up your question for our next episode. So let's get started. first segment, what's new with ChatGPT? Now, for those who don't know what ChatGPT truly is, it is a digital companion that is capable of answering questions, paraphrasing, summarizing, in a sense, making our work a little better. If you clip in a piece of your code that you're typing, it can actually find faults and it can also help to make it better. Or if you're stuck with summarizing a particular content for your book, for your blog, for your article, if you have a few outlines and if you tell it that this is how you want to paraphrase it, it can actually make your work piece even look better. And because of this, a lot of bloggers are actually flocking to ChatGPT usage so that they can make their content and and blogs and articles read even better, which again, raises other ethical questions in itself. Now, ChatGPT was originally launched by OpenAI, which is a predominantly researcher-based community on November 30th, 2022. And according to the latest available data, ChatGPT currently has over 100 million users and the whole website currently generates about a billion visitors per month. Why, you may ask, such large number of users? Predominantly because it's free. It's free for anybody to try out. And of course, there are versions where you can upgrade in order to, you know, pay for a better, more reliable experience. Now let's take a look at some of the, you know, timelines for the development so far. On January 9th, 2023, there was an improvement in the factuality. And also a stop generation was added. So typically you can actually keep asking the same question multiple number of times and the chat GPT will give you a different paraphrased outcome every single time. But sometimes if you want it to you know, stop generating uh, results, which you think is going off the rails, then you can actually have that feature enabled as well. Now on January 30th, there were improved mathematical capabilities that came with chat GPT. So think about it. It's a purely language model, which can only operate on language and text. Now, if you start asking it, what is the mean of all of these numbers? Or what is the what is the maximum score? What is the minimum score? ChatGPT was not able to deal with them in the early days. But now with the January 30th improvement, it is capable of doing some very basic mathematical you know, evaluations. Now, the model that was used that was released with ChatGPT was called DaVinci 003. And then in February 9th, some turbo features were added, which made it Uh, version 3.5. And the turbo features essentially helped with higher speed. Now, on February 13th, a plus feature was added where users could now upgrade to a better experience. So because of the such large number of users that are packing and flocking to ChatGPT on on a daily basis, there used to be outages. So a lot of people would not be able to log in. In these cases, the plus feature makes sure that you get on a priority list so that you are served first and then the free users are served later. 
So this becomes a premium or a paid version, which is about $20 a month. Now in March, the chat GPT-4 was, was released with additional complex reasoning. And we saw improved uh, mathematical reasoning along with composite reasoning. So if you have text along with mathematical data, which is going with it, chat GPT was able to make a complex decision based off of both in a better way than you know, the Vinci 003 was. So by March, there was this question that started, you know, flourishing in most of the users' minds is how can we productize, uh, you know, ChatGPT? Can we add it with other products? Uh, can it just become a plugin so that, you know, I can use it locally uh, as well? And with this regard, on March 23rd, ChatGPT plugin version was launched for browsing. But there is also a current wish list for a productization aspect of it. So if you're interested, you can actually get on that wish list as well. Now comes the interesting parts are all of the recent disputes that have come with ChatGPT. Now, of course, such a novel concept, a novel idea, which was released to the world with the, with the, with the intention of making the research faster and better so that if everybody is typing in questions, if everybody is providing data, the model can only keep getting way better very fast. But what started to happen is late March, there were countries, you know, in Italy, the data protection watchdog, which was called Garante, they cited a data breach at OpenAI, which allowed users to view the titles of conversations that other users were happening with the chatbot. And this was violating the basic GDPR guidelines. However, right now, it might be that in by late April, uh, ChatGPT might return back to Italy. So the second major dispute that actually came up was with regards to the plus feature customer. So the people who had actually paid to get a better experience with ChatGPT, their in payment information was stored at, at a particular you know, location. And that was the ChatGPT's cache history. And somehow this cache history was divulged through some other users uh, in which there was the you know, last four digits and the expiration dates of the credit cards, along with the you know names and last names and the payment address. And this payment leak affected about 1.2% of the Ch ChatGPT Plus users and that were servicing the system between 4 a.m. and 1 p.m. Eastern time on the March 20th. And because of this, ChatGPT went offline for that whole day in order to make sure the investigation was correctly made. And the third major breach that happened was on April 6th. And this is famously called the Samsung ChatGPT leak. Now, Samsung employees accidentally shared confidential information while using ChatGPT for help at work. Now, Samsung's uh, you know, semiconductor division had allowed the engineers to use ChatGPT to check their code. And ChatGPT currently, their positioning is that it can really do well when you place some, your, some snippet of your code, it can find faults and it can also make it better. So that's exactly what had happened with the Samsung Semiconductors division. However, there were engineers, there were three instances where, where engineers, they, they just copied the whole, uh, you know, text of very innovative code uh, in order to, you know, get it checked. And well, that put all of that code in public domain. So make sure if you don't want any of your text to be made public domain, do not upload it or don't query it on ChatGPT. Right. However, if you can make uh, maybe a dummified version of it or if you can paraphrase it somewhere else uh, or if you just don't care if that information goes to public domain, definitely, by all means, try out ChatGPT and stay tuned for more updates next week. Now we come to my favorite segment, which is the frequently asked questions. So let's take a look at some of your burning questions and let's try to answer them. The first question is, what are some of the recent useful tools for developers and enthusiasts in the field of AI? Now, the field of AI is very vast and broad. And in this case, you can see some of the use cases or the major use cases that industry is going towards. One is natural language processing with all of the you know, chat GPT and, and everything in and around it. And the second one predominantly is going to be computer vision, where anything to do with images, uh, automation in and around it, you know, that's the computer vision do domain. So for the NLP or anybody who is an enthusiast in the field of natural language processing, you may know that, of course, DaVinci 003, Turbo, these are some of the models that are fueling your you know, chat GPT-4. You can definitely fine tune it to your data using the chat GPT's API. And again, that's for researchers and academics only. However, if you want to get access to these models in the industry level, then Azure's GPT-3 offering is pretty useful as well. 
However, we are seeing some of some of the other competitors also come up with similar performing um, you know, models equivalent to ChatGPT. So one of these models is called ChatGLM 6 billion, and it is released by this team in China, which predominantly is used to, again, do question answering, something very similar. Um, you know, performance is very similar to that of ChatGPT, but if you have questions in Mandarin, or if you want them translated, you can actually use that uh, pretty well. But if you have complex data, such as a you know, composite of table data, along with normal text data, ChatGLM can also do a pretty good job. And the second Second most predominant ChatGPT alternative is called Alpaca, which has been trained with 7 billion parameters. And it has been released by Stanford University, where they claim that the cost to make it is less than $600. So if it's any of the other ChatGPT variants that you want to try out, then these two would be your best shot. There is another way of generating your own chat GPT. And again, I will be releasing a video on it pretty shortly on my YouTube channel. But if you're interested in generating similar performances, you have to understand all you need is a good summarizer and a paraphraser. So the Transformers, and I don't mean the movies here, the Transformers library within PyTorch, they have actually included very good chat GPT like summarizers and paraphrasers, which is called T5. So T5 large and the T5 base versions can actually be used for summarizing and paraphrasing content under the whole umbrella of the Transformers library. Now, getting into computer vision, there has been a very exciting outcome this week from Meta. And this model is called Segment Anything Model or SAM. And Segment Anything Model, as you can see here, is capable of taking your new images and segmenting all of the regions of interest. So just for the, for the sake of it, I actually uploaded this very background and me in it to a Segment Anything uh, Model. And it actually did a pretty good job at segmenting my foreground so that I could use it in any of my stickers going forward. So if you are interested or if you're generating, uh, you know, new campaigning content or if you are generating new marketing content, SAM can be an extremely beneficial tool where you can take images and it will segment it to as many regions of interest as you need. And it, the, the quality and definition is pretty intricate because it was able to also segment the background for a very complex image as well. So I heavily motivate you to try it out. And for all of the things that I am talking about in this video, please find this video in YouTube if you want to find the links to immediately go and try them out. Now let's go to the next question. My second question is, what are some of the AI-based courses for healthcare domain that can be taken for upskilling at undergraduate levels? Well, this becomes an interesting question. So if you are at an undergraduate level and you want to specialize in healthcare, the best place to start is always going to be Coursera. And I do not say it to endorse Coursera in any, any way, but it's just that because those course contents have been created by faculty from top-notch universities and the fact that it is absolutely free to start and you only need to pay if you want a certification. So that makes the job easier to, for you to figure out, do you even like this content? And if you don't, just drop and find something else. So the first four core specialization that I found in Coursera is called AI and healthcare specialization. And this is by Stanford University, which goes into detail if you really want to build a career in AI and healthcare. The second related source that I found is called IBM AI for Healthcare, where you can go and read up about all of the latest and greatest that is coming off of IBM AI healthcare division. The third that I found again, in Coursera is these two offerings by deeplearning.ai. And again, I'm not endorsing any company as such. It's called AI for Medicine and AI for Medical Diagnosis. And here you will learn what are the different tools and approaches in order for you to work with medical images for doing diagnostics, for being a physician's aide, for all of the overarching learning in and around medical diagnostics, you will be able to use the tools that are suggested in this course. And all the courses that I suggested here, they are all beginners level. So you don't need any prior uh, skill set in coding in order to even start with that.
Now let's get to the last question of the day. And this question is the most technical one. So this is more so for people who are very hands-on in the computer vision tools that I have been talking about in my channel. Now the question is, how do we evaluate models like mask our CNN when large images are used? So these would be instances, let's say that you are looking at satellite imagery or at images, astronomical images, where the best outcome is always to separate the whole image into patches. And these patches can sometimes be tiled patches or they can also be overlapping patches. But the only difference that you need to understand here is the evaluation should always happen for the composite image. So let's consider an example. You have a satellite imagery for a particular domain and the image is extremely huge. So it's 5,000 pixels by 5,000 pixels. And your goal is to find all of the different objects of interest you know, that come up. So if it's farmland, if it's buildings, if it's road construction, everything that you see, you want to segment them. Now, ideally, a 5,000 by 5,000 image would not even load in a, in a typical Python setting. So what you should be doing is, first of all, generating sub patches, maybe patch it up to, you know, 64 by 64, 128 by 128 sized images. And these images could be tiled or they can be, you know, overlapping patches as well. And if you are segmenting everything on it, then you can even pass, you know, through a unit or even a mask or CNN. Once you have the results, put all of these patches back and create the composite image before sending it to evaluation. Now, you may ask what would happen if there's a portion of an object in one image or one patch and another portion in another. So in these cases, you literally have to make sure that you aggregate. Maybe you consider only one object rather than counting each and every object in each and every patch. So there has to be some aggregation for the objects that are around the border of the patch regions. And once you have the whole composite image, only then perform your, you know, jacquard dice or, you know, semantic segmentation computations in order to see what was the performance. And that concludes the FAQ segment for today. I hope you find it useful and I look forward to answering way more of your questions next week. So please, please, please do give this video a thumbs up if you liked it and follow us for more trends and FAQs next week.